You see, our Prophet ﷺ said that every single Prophet is granted one wish, one desire that he wishes. One desire that he has, Allah gives him. So every Prophet has a special dua that they know Allah will give them. So the Prophet Sulaiman made a dua, and we have it in the Quran. Qala Rabbi habli mulkan la yanbaghi li ahadin min ba'di. Sulaiman said, Oh Allah, I want power and the kingdom like no other human will ever have after me. I want to have a kingdom, a mulk, a dominion, a control that no other human being will ever have. So Allah says, فَسَخَّرْنَا لَهُ الْرِيحَ تَجْرِي بِأَمْرِهِ رُخَاءً حَيْثُ أَصَابٍ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ So we gave him the control of the winds. And the winds would take him wherever he wants. In another surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, that in the morning it would take him one month journey. And in the evening it would bring him back in a one month journey. And so from this, we get the myth or the legend that every school child knows of the flying carpet. There was a real flying carpet once upon a time, and it was owned by Sulaiman. But the carpet didn't fly. Allah controlled the winds, and Allah allowed the winds to pick up this carpet. And sitting on this carpet, Sulaiman would go wherever he went, and he would come back a month journey. He would go, and he would come back the same evening. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالشَّيَاطِينَ كُلَّنْ بَنَّاءٍ وَغَوَّاسٍ We also gave him control of the shayateen, of the jinn. And these jinn would obey his command. Some of them would even dive into the oceans. Ghawas is a diver. And Banna, they would build magnificent structures. You know, there are these legends of the Temple of Solomon and how grandiose it was. Well, it was grandiose because it wasn't built by men. It was built by another species and another creature. So we are now standing at the uh, original structure of the Prophet Sulaiman uh, the only part of the original uh, Haikat or the temple that the Prophet Sulaiman built. This structure is literally over 3,000 years old and it is the only remnants that we have uh, that were built at the time of Sulaiman If you take a look at it and especially if you want to come over here as well, uh, just, just look at how large these bricks are, these stones are. And this is why the, the legend quote unquote is, and of course I don't believe it's a legend, I believe it is a complete truth and fact that, that uh, it was the jinn who helped construct this because Allah Azza wa gave Sulaiman the power over the jinn. And Allah Azza wa mentions that the jinns would help him construct. Just look at this massive block of stone here. How, how did these blocks get into place? We don't have any equivalent of this huge and massive one after the other. And it is also, uh, it is also a, a reputed, and again, as we said, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this is the place where our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa prayed and he led the 120,000 prophets in prayer. So this place and this region, because it is the only place where the remnants, and of course, this is the foundation. The actual temple of Suleiman was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, 500 something BC. So it's been destroyed for the longest time. But 3,000 years ago, when the Prophet Suleiman built the temple, this was the foundations of the temple, and this is the only remnants that still remain of the actual original temple of Sulaiman. Um, honestly, words are failing me right now. This is such a, an emotional experience for me. For, for, um, for decades of my life, I have been wanting to come and, and, and pray uh, in uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa and uh, to be in uh, the, uh, the place where so many prophets have come. Uh, the place that in half a dozen verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this is the holy land uh, the land that is associated with uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam with Ya'qub uh, with uh, Musa wanting to come here and uh, our Prophet telling us that he wanted to die looking upon Al Masjid Al-Aqsa looking upon Jerusalem uh, with Isa ibn Maryam with so many of the Prophet Sulaiman uh, all of these prophets there Zakaria and uh, the fact that our Prophet Muhammad and came to this very land, this very uh, area, and he led each and every prophet in prayer. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed uh, us to come here and pray uh, and uh, be a part of, uh, of the jama'ah right now. It's after Fajr, a beautiful day after Fajr. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, they think that this is Masjid al-Aqsa. This is not Masjid al-Aqsa. This is in fact the Dome of the Rock. This is uh, where uh, inside is the, um, is the rock where, uh, so it is said, the Prophet ascended to Mi'raj. This is not the Masjid. That's a very big mistake. It is uh, uh, the, the, the Dome of the Rock, Al-Qubba al -Sabra. that's fine, you can call it the Dome of the Rock. Masjid Al-Aqsa is in fact uh, over here. This is Masjid Al-Aqsa over there. Okay, so Masjid Al-Aqsa 
is facing the Dome of the Rock. And that is the place, obviously, where the Prophet ﷺ uh, prayed. And uh, it is, uh, again, it's not something that the famous dome that we see is not over there, but that is the actual uh, masjid. Now, this entire sanctuary, of course, this is a massive sanctuary. A lot of people don't realize. In fact, I didn't even realize how large this place is. And in this uh, ayah that we recited, or in this uh, surah, the Surah Al-Naml, we also learn of another story of Suleiman with the jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you all know the queen of Saba was a powerful uh, queen in what is now Yemen. And the queen of Saba was legendary for her wisdom, for her power, for her dominion. And she had a magnificent palace and she had a very beautiful throne. And so Suleiman wanted to show the queen of Saba that her power was nothing compared to the power of Allah. And so he asked his army and his army included birds, and it included men, it included animals, it included the jinn. He asked his army, أَيُّكُمْ يَأْتِينِي بِعَرْشِهَا قَبْلَ أَنْ يَأْتُونِي مُسْلِمِينَ Who can bring me their throne before they come submitting? I want to show them this power that, that Allah has blessed me with. And so Allah says, قَالَ عِفْرِيتٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ Jinns are many different categories. And the most evil of them is called Ifrit. The Ifrit is the most evil, the most dastardly, the most powerful. The Ifrit of the jinn are the ones that are the worst of the jinn. But Allah gave Suleiman control over them. So the worst of the jinn, the Ifrit of the jinn, he said, "Ana atika bihi qabla an taquma min maqamik, wa inni alayhi la qawiyun amin." He said, "I will bring you this throne before you can stand up, before you can stand up from your place." That is how much? Two milliseconds, millisecond and a half. Before you can stand up, I will have the throne in front of you. Give me permission. I am very trustworthy and I'm very honest. Why does he have to say this? Because he has to be released from the shackles of Sulaiman. He has to be released and he has to be trusted to go and get the throne. So he says, I am strong and I am trustworthy. And by the way, from the time of Sulaiman, our scholars of tafsir and history also mention a legend, a story, and from it we get the legends and the fairy tales of our times that Sulaiman, to punish a jinn, had him trapped in a bottle. And this is where we get the genie in the bottle from. That to punish a jinn and to, and to, get, uh, and to give him a taste of his own medicine, Sulaiman had trapped uh, this jinn and put, not this one, I'm talking about another story, and had put him in a bottle. And from this, the legends that children, school children here, still to this day, where is the basis of it? It goes back to the Prophet Sulaiman. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the reality of the jinn, which is why I said today's khatir will be a little bit different. And inshallah, there is a lot of benefit. It's also iman boosting as well. The jinn here, this story tells us a lot about the jinn. This story tells us a lot about the powers of the jinn. The jinn are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are very different than us. And Allah created the jinn before He created man. How do we know this? The story of Adam alayhi salam, right? فَسَجَلَ الْمَلَائِكُتُ كُلُّمْ أَجْمَعُونَ إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ there was already Iblis and all of the other jinn. Iblis was of the jinn, by the way, because Allah clearly says in Surah Al-Kahf, كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ Iblis was of the jinn. فَفَسَقْ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِ And Iblis, when Adam was created, Iblis walked around him. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Iblis walked around him to see what is this creation and poked him and found him to be hollow. Because we're hollow, we have holes, we have a hole inside of us. And so Iblis said, huh, I will have control over this hollow creature. I'll be able to get inside him and be able to control him. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the shayateen run through you like your blood does. They have the ability to go inside of us and give us evil thoughts. So the jinn were created before Adam salam, And Allah gave the jinn powers that he did not give Adam. Allah created the jinn from a smokeless fire. From a smokeless fire. Now, if you want to get a little bit uh, Einsteinian or, or physical here, this basically means they are created from a type of energy. It's a type of energy that is beyond our spectrum of visual energy. You see, light is only one spectrum of energy, right? And our visual light, it's a minuscule fraction. There are many types of energies, infrared and ultraviolet and, and, and waves and all of these. They're different types of energy. The shayateen are basically created from something we would call energy. And what this means, because they're beyond the spectrum of our visual energy, they are to our eyes invisible. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ Iblis and his army can see you from an area you cannot see them. إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ They can see you, you cannot see them. Because they live in a world that 
we cannot sense, our eyes cannot see that energy. Just like we cannot see ultraviolet, we cannot see radio waves, similarly we cannot see that type of uh, uh, creation of the jinn. Also because the jinn are created from energy or, or from a smokeless fire, they don't have a physical body. They don't have flesh and bones. And so the Ifrit says, I can go from your palace and go all the way to the palace of the queen of, 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 of uh, Saba and enter it even though the doors are locked, even though there's army there, but the jinn is invisible for the eyes of men. And so he can enter this palace and nobody will see this jinn. Also, because they are created from what we call energy, how fast does energy travel? The speed of light, right? And we learn as well that this Ifrit says, before you stand up, I will go, where is Sulaiman now? Jerusalem. Where is the queen of Saba? Yemen, right? Uh, Sana'a, right? Sana'a, right? Yemeni people, where is he? Sana'a. Yeah, and so from Jerusalem to Sana'a, this Ifrit is going to literally, in one and a half milliseconds, go and come back. Even in the most fastest supersonic jet that we had, it would take at least two and a half, three hours to do this one way. This Ifrit will do it in a millisecond and a half. Why? Because Allah created the jinn from a smokeless fire, which is energy. And energy can go around the world, can go up and down, literally like the speed of light. And so this is the power of the jinn. Notice another power of the jinn, and that is that the jinn has, now this is very deep here for those of you who are into physics, uh, and I like physics myself, so that's why I go into these tangents. The jinn has the power to convert physical structure into energy. How do we know this? Because Ifrit says, I will take the, the, uh, the throne and bring it back to your palace. Now, in order to get this throne out of the room and carry it away, this means it will simply disappear and it will be transported, just like we have in the science fiction uh, Star, Star Trek, right? The transportation, right? It's going to be transported in a world that we cannot see. And this, of course, goes back to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, energy and, and matter. All of this goes back. There's a reality to this. And the jinn have this energy that Allah has given them, that they can take something physical, change it to energy, transport it all the way to Jerusalem, and then re-bring it back into the physical matter that it was. This is the power that Allah has given them. Also notice another power that Allah has given them. They are physically stronger than men. They are physically stronger than men. One ifrit can lift up the entire throne. And a throne like this might take 40, 50 men to pick up. So one Ifrit can pick up this entire throne and fly with it from uh, Sana'a all the way to Jerusalem. And this shows us perhaps the pinnacle of what the jinn can do. Why? Because only one jinn, and that was the Ifrit said he could do this. So this is like the bar, the highest. Not all the jinn are this powerful. Not all the jinn are that capable. This is the bar, this is the pinnacle that in Sulaiman's army, when he controls the billions and billions of jinn, one jinn has that power and this shows us the, 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 the bar, if you like. Not all the jinn have that type of strength. Also, the jinn have uh, one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made different from the men and the jinn. Allah has chosen the men over the jinn in terms of knowledge. Men have more knowledge than jinn, and men have more intellectual capabilities than jinn. And therefore, because of this reason, Allah has preferred Adam and the children of Adam over jinn. And this is a beautiful point here, that even though the jinn are more powerful, and the jinn basically, we don't call it flying because this is energy, but they can basically go anywhere they want, faster than we can, and they have more strength than us, and they cannot see us, sorry, we cannot see them, they can see us, still we are more beloved to Allah than them. What is the evidence for this? Allah says to Iblis, make says to Adam, who is the better of the two? And that's why Iblis is feeling the jealousy, because he said, Ana khayrun min. I was supposed to be better, why are you preferring him? What does this show? Knowledge is more beloved to Allah than physical brute strength. Knowledge is more preferred to Allah, and that is why the prophets of Allah and the messengers of Allah have all been human. There are no prophets and messengers from the jinn. And that is why the jinns follow our religions. There are Jewish jinns, Christian jinn, Muslim jinn, Buddhist jinn, Hindu jinn. 
We don't follow their religions, right? The Quran mentions a group of Jewish jinns. Nafaru min al jinni yastami'una ilayk. The Quran mentions, right? Inna sami'na kitaban unzila min ba'di Musa. A group of jinn who became sahaba. And these were the sahaba of the jinn. Even the jinn have sahaba. They were Jews, the Quran tells us. And when they heard the Quran, they converted. So the jinns follow our religions. We don't follow their religions. The jinns learn our languages. We don't learn their languages. Culturally, our civilization, our intellect is above that of the jinns. And that is why the jinns feel an immense, an immense jealousy, an immense hatred. And that jealousy is what is one of the motivational factors that drives them to oppose us. That they wanted to have that place over us. And it is only the evil jinns who oppose us. And as we know, uh, or, or I'll tell you now that the jinns, they are much more than the men. Ya ma'ashir al-jinni qad istakthartum min al-ins. One interpretation of this verse, O groups of jinn, you are much more than the men. Qad istakthartum min al-ins. One of the, there's many meanings of this verse. One meaning is, you are much more than the ins. And we have it in legends, it's not in the Quran and Sunnah, in legends and from interactions that happen on and off, we learn that the jinns, they multiply much more than we do. That the jinn might have five, six, seven thousand children and that they have longer lifespans than us. Two, three, four thousand years maybe. Because they don't have the same creation as us. They're not physical entities. So their time is different and their, uh, and their uh, uh, um, way of living is different as well. Now the jinns eat and drink and the jinns marry and the jinns have children and the jinns have their own food. Our Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim that when you eat a bone, don't defile the bone. Don't put nudges on the bone. Don't wipe yourself after the, use the bathroom with the bone. Don't put dirt or evil on the bone. Why? Because I made dua to Allah and this bone will become the food of our brothers from the jinn, i.e. the Muslim jinn. So any food that we eat and we leave it with, it, it seems to us to be nothing. That bone has nothing. Allah will provide food for the Muslim jinns. The Muslim jinns only. As for the non-Muslim or the Kafir jinns, they try to eat our food directly. But if we say Bismillah, then they are forbidden from eating it. They try to eat our food directly. In other words, whatever we eat, they try to, Allah knows how, when they come into us or whatever they do, they try to benefit from this food. But if we say Bismillah, then they cannot eat of this food. Now, a lot of people have legends and, and misunderstandings about the jinn. A lot of people are scared of the jinn. And this is not the purpose of talking about the jinn. The reality is the jinn are weaker than us if we turn to Allah. If we turn to Allah, the jinn are weaker than us. And firstly, the Muslim jinn do not harm us. The Muslim jinn are our brethren. And they leave us be and we leave them be. Secondly, the non-Muslim jinn, the non-Muslim jinn, their main method of harming us is not by turning on and off the light switch or by making our pen disappear or by wondering where our homework has gone. You go to the teacher and say, the jinn took my homework. No, no, no. That's not the way. The main way they harm us is what? Waswas. Min sharril waswas il khannas. This is the main way they harm us. What is waswas? Waswas means they have inner thoughts. Like they're flowing in our blood and they will whisper something evil and they will want us to do something bad. This is the main way they harm us. And we turn to Allah to seek refuge from the waswas. Thirdly, as for the fears that many people have, non-Muslim and Muslim, that there's houses that are haunted and things go bump in the night, we firmly believe that the human soul does not live on this earth and that we don't see ghosts. We don't believe in ghosts. We don't believe the human soul goes and haunts somewhere that it died. No, this is not true at all. The human ruh goes to the grave where it is. Except for the shuhada, they are in uh, the birds in Jannah. Therefore, if there is something that is inexplicable, noises or light, something that is documented, this is coming from the jinn. So we can easily explain the paranormal by saying this is the jinn. Now why does the jinn do this? Because the jinn finds it funny that you're so scared of it. And the jinn likes to cause us to be misguided, fall into superstition. The jinn basically plays a practical joke on us. And so the mu'min who understands and sees through this practical joke is irritated and not scared. And the mu'min will say, A'udhu Billah, 
Astaghfirullah. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. And the jinn will disappear. Because when you invoke the name of Allah, they cannot be in the presence of the name of Allah. When you recite the Quran, when you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, when you recite Ayat Al-Kursi, the jinn disappear and vanish. In fact, even when you recite the Adhan, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? It's a funny hadith and, 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 and yet it is something that's disgusting about the jinn. That when you recite, when you say the Adhan, the jinns flee away and they break wind. They pass gas. Why? Because they don't want to hear the Adhan. They do something sacrilegious. They make fun of the Adhan by this sound. Why? Because they cannot bear to hear the Adhan. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? They turn and they run away. They flee. Therefore, we as Muslims need to understand, we, we don't fear the jinn, not at all. No, we put our trust in Allah and we realize that Allah has created different species, different creatures of the benefits of studying about the jinn. Our Iman in Allah increases, that Allah is so powerful. He has created different beings. He has created men, He has created animals, He has created jinn. Of the benefits of studying about the jinn, we feel humbled that Allah has chosen us over the rest of the creatures. Even though this species has so many powers we don't have, still we have more blessings than the jinn. And Allah has preferred us over the jinn. Of the benefits of studying about the jinn, is that we realize that because we don't see the jinn, we need the protection of Allah to protect us against the jinn. We need Allah's protection. And the more closer we are to Allah, and the more dhikr we do, and the more Quran we recite, the, the more fortress that we have against the jinn. Our Prophet ﷺ said that dhikr is a fortress that protects you from shaitan. And that's why when we go out of the house, we do dhikr. When we enter the house, we do dhikr. When we enter the restroom, we seek Allah's refuge from the jinn. Because the jinn, these non-Muslim jinn, the Muslim jinn, they are good. The non-Muslim jinn, they love filth and they love najasa. And so they love to be where there's filth and najasa, which is the toilet. So when we enter, we seek Allah's refuge from the jinn. So knowing that there is an enemy out there makes us more on guard. We're always turning to Allah, wanting to have a relationship with Allah. Few final points. The myth that exists that some people control the jinn, right? This is something very common in our culture. And especially we hear it from, I mean, with all respect to our grandmothers and great grandmothers, basically the women. They like to talk like this. They say, oh, my friend, she could control the jinn. Or I knew this great saint, there was a jinn who would be uh, giving him khidmah or, 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 or helping him out. This is all old wives' tales. No truth to it. Why do we know this? Because Sulaiman said, I want the control that nobody else does. It was Sulaiman who could control the jinn. No other human being can control the jinn. No one. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said in a hadith, when he was reading uh, Salah once, hadith is in Bukhari, that when he was reading the Salah, he stepped back. And the Sahaba didn't understand what's happening. But because they're following him so much, they all stepped back along with him. The whole masjid moved back. And then he stepped forward. And the whole masjid stepped forward. And then he finished the Salah. And then he explained what happened. Is that uh, shaitan came to me and he tried to brandish some fire of hell, a stick from the fire of hell. So I stepped back and sought Allah's refuge. And then I came forward to conquer him and to control him. And I was almost about to tie him up and let him be in the masjid so that the children could play with him. But then I remembered the dua of Sulaiman. When he said, And so I didn't do this. What this means is the Prophet ﷺ could have had that power. He could have, but out of respect to his brother Sulaiman, right? That Sulaiman wanted something nobody else had, so our Prophet said, okay, I'll let him have it. I won't have this power, right? So this shows us if our Prophet voluntarily refused to control the jinn, who on earth can then say, oh, I have control over a jinn? This is not true. Nobody controls the jinn. And one final point that we conclude, inshallah, the issue of black magic, the issue of sihr, the issue of sihr is real. We believe in sihr. Ahlul Sunnah affirms sihr. Sihr is real. What is sihr? Sihr is the magician communicating with the jinn and asking the jinn to do some favors in return for the magician doing a favor to the jinn. The magician does not control the jinn. This is a myth again. Nobody controls the jinn. The magician does not control the jinn. What does the magician do? The magician says to the jinn, I'll worship you. And in return, you do something for me. I scratch my back, you scratch 
Uh, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. It is literally a transaction. And so the magician has to do kufr and shirk. Otherwise, he cannot be a magician. Every sahir has to do shirk in order to do his sihr. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, وَاتَّبَعُ مَا تَتْوَ الشَّيَاطِينَ عَلَى مُلْكُ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفْرُ يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ Sihr and kufr are linked together. The magician does not control the jinn. In fact, we don't have time for this, but in fact, the jinn controls the magician more than the magician controls the jinn. And this is a common myth that people think that the magician controls the jinn. Not at all. How do you fight the jinn? How do you fight sihr? By turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, reciting the last two verses of, of, of Surah Al-Baqarah. This is how we fight the jinn. And believe you me, and I speak from experience, but I won't tell you any stories. Believe you me, you turn to Allah and you recite the Quran, and wallahi, you see with your own eyes, Ra'yal Ain, you see with your own eyes that these beings have no power at all when you invoke the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Muslim, the Mu'min, is never scared of the jinn. He is only scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the mu'min turns to Allah, then all fears dissolve. And therefore, if you encounter something strange, if something like this happens, do not be scared. Put your trust in Allah. Recite the Quran. Turn to Him. Seek refuge in Him. And inshaAllah ta'ala, you will overcome this evil creature. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the waswas of this khannas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to, to conquer our evil, uh, uh, our evil jinn and make sure that He doesn't give us the evil impact. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to be righteous and cause us to live as Muslims and to die as Muslims and to be resurrected as Muslims. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.